Okay, well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's it's uh, really wonderful. It, uh, it's a, I always love uh, coming to India. It's my second time, and uh, and it's uh, it's nice to see uh, the the composition of the audience. I was walking here and I was talking to some students. It's uh, also challenging to prepare for for this uh, wide range of uh, of uh, of an audience, and I have uh, tried to kind of. Uh, uh, provide some examples that are uh, motivated from kind of real life applications. I changed the title a little bit. Uh, well, I changed the title a lot, but uh, not the content. So uh, the original title I sent was uh, something along the lines, Optimal Transport Methods in Economics, Statistics, and Operation Research. Uh, you can, in the end, what I'm more interested in the talk is the second, is more the later part, Optimal Transport uh, is a tool that could be used as many others, but I believe it's quite flexible for these problems. So I'm going to talk about optimal transport in the first today, this lecture. And that is, uh, I'm going to motivate the use of optimal transport uh, as, a, as a way to kind of analyze markets, for example, in economics. That's also, that's a very nice and interesting applications in operations research and in particular in the Bay Area these, these days. So the methods of optimal transport are going to be motivated with the idea of you know, applications in stats and, and uh, economics. That's what is the first part of, uh, of, of the uh, lectures I'm going to be giving. So today is going to be about that, basically just kind of getting familiar with optimal transport and, uh, and various, various notions of that sort. And then we are going to be, in the second, the later part, the last two lectures, we are going to be moving on to uh, problems of uh, model misspecification precisely and making inference and, and um, evaluating performance uh, measures and optimization and control on their model misspecification. So this, is, uh, this lecture involves uh, this particular, the first one is basically, you know, very traditional topics. I'm going to be recommending textbooks. And as we progress, it's going to start becoming more and more research oriented, more uh, related to topics that are more, more current, of papers that have been published in the last three years or so. And then I'm going to give a research lecture later, which is going to be papers that are, you know, that were posted like, you know, a few, few weeks or a few months ago. So it's going to hopefully kind of giving progression to that. All right. Um, so the goal is to, the, the big picture, the goal is to introduce a systematic approach to quantify and mitigate the impact of uh, model misspecification. So, the, so I'm going to come, keep coming to the following very often, okay? So keep reminding you of the big picture. At the beginning in this lecture, you might not see the link to the big picture, but, but it is there and you will see it later, okay? So the, the big picture is that as a modeler, so what is the, um, think of the natural modeling cycle that uh, that uh, involves a problem in applied probability, in OR, in, in optimization. So you have, uh, you build a model, right? You feed the model with data. Uh, you believe the model. You know, at that point, you, you have uncertainty, but you basically have a notion of a model. How do you build the model? You balance the information you have. You balance tractability and the... Um, and reality. You balance, you know, the model fidelity and reality, and you go with that model. And then you optimize, hopefully, if you have done your, you know, uh, if you have picked a tractable enough model, and then you prescribe, okay? And that's it. This is how the modeling cycle goes, right? Uh, you, you might backtest to make sure that the model has been, has the stylized features that you, that you want somehow, and then you go. And the problem is that, uh, you, you, you really didn't get the correct model. We all know that models are bound to be incorrect. And uh, the, the point is that how do you, how to inform uh, your decision-making problem, your decisions, and the impact of your decisions by the fact that the model is incorrect, basically, right? And so that's precisely the goal, so right? How to introduce a systematic approach to inform that sort of thing. There are many ways of doing that, right? Um, and I, I am going to present, I'm going to talk about one way which I think is, is very flexible and, and why is flexible goes to the core of the theory of optimal transport. So that's, there could be many models, right? But the theory of optimal transport I think provides a lot of flexibility 
to actually carry out precisely this goal. So to, to explain then what, uh, that, uh, you know, what, how to apply the theory uh, to carry out this goal, I first need to explain to you what the theory is, what the theory of optimal transport is, and then you will start seeing why it's flexible, okay? So, so the, today I'm going to talk about, I'm going to introduce to you the theory of optimal transport. We are going to see that this is a, this at the core of optimal transport, there is a class of uh, very um, nice, very well-behaved optimization problems. In fact, linear programming problems, and we're going to talk about the primal and the dual. And we're going to talk about, you know, interpretations of the primal, interpretations of the dual, and that's going to be, uh, you know, the very basic properties to just gain familiarity with the problem, get familiar with the notions. The, the cool thing is, uh, you know, as we go and interpret the, these basic uh, features of optimal transport, they have nice economic interpretations. And already, if you, know, if you are interested in economics or pricing problems, which are extremely um, popular and interesting, there is an avenue of research there that is uh, related but different from this uh, model misspecification uh, sort of goal that I have in mind. But, uh, but we can also talk about that if you are interested. So we are going to talk about economic interpretations to gain sort of intuition. Then we are going to uh, see, uh, connect the theory of optimal transport with a class of distances. And now we are going to start touching on the statistics. So first economics to gain intuition, but then we're going to start seeing that uh, the connection to statistics. So some of you might have heard uh, this uh, this term, Wasserstein distance. So that's a class of distances that are very popular in economics and, sorry, in, in statistics. They have been rediscovered many times in different areas. And uh, you are going to, we are going to see um, that uh, optimal transport is an encompassing theory that actually, you know, by, is so flexible. And this is, we are going to start hinting of why do I think this is a good vehicle to model uh, um, to quantify model misspecification, because we're going to see that Wasserstein distances actually, uh, are, uh, they are so encompassing, they encompass total variation distance, they encompass weak convergence topology, so these two things that you learn in courses in probability that lead to very different topologies, in fact, they all are the same thing if you look at it from the lens of optimal transport, so that's kind of interesting and, and cool. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, and then we're going to move to applying this in machine learning. And this is where we are going to start seeing, you know, quantifying model misspecification. We're going to see how optimal transport phenomena is at the core of generalization error, is at the core of, uh, of regularization, and is at the core of all of these properties that are understood to be relevant, extremely important in, uh, in machine learning. We're going to talk about uh, sort of uh, how the role of optimal transport and, uh, and different notions of convexity, you know, the, the optimal transport also generalizes convexity uh, uh, by, by thinking of, uh, of a transformation uh, for which, you know, linear uh, functions are just a particular case. And that leads potentially to other optim to optimization algorithms, I think, but I'm not exploring that, I'm just kind of throwing it there. I'm going to sprinkler sort of different directions related to optimal transport, you know, for people who are actually interested in, op in optimization, in stochastic optimization. Then we're going to go to discuss some applications to operations research. Uh, we are going to interpret, you know, worst case adversarial uh, models, and we are going to connect that to, to very, you know, current research in artificial intelligence, testing, training, Adversarial networks, again, we are going to see that at the core of these algorithms for training adversarial networks is also, is also the theory of optimal transport. So, so this is just to kind of give, give a hint of, of why do I think it's extremely flexible paradigm. Uh, there are, there are, we'll, I'm going to close the three lectures with uh, lots of open questions because uh, even though, I mean, we, I, I still don't know and I think nobody knows if this is the right way of kind of thinking about model misspecification. But there are all of these hints that we're going to see throughout these three lectures, the connections to machine learning, the connection to generalization, the connections to regularizations, the connection to adversarial training of neural networks, the flexibility to use this in the context of Brownian models and diffusions and 
just it just feels very powerful. It just feels kind of just uh, uh, just flexible enough, but we don't really know. Uh, and so those are one of the things that kind of are more research oriented. Okay, so that's what's in the menu. This is what we are going to do. Okay. So to do this, then I'm going to start with the first bullet. So I'm going to talk about optimal transport first and primals and duals. Yes. Um, you, you mean the, the, the notion of, uh, of, of the 2008 uh, stuff of Hansen? It, it is uh, very related. It is very related. So in, in fact, the Hansen and Sargent uh, kind of way of thinking is taken from papers in 2000 by, by uh, Paul Dupuy and James and that group of people in the control theory community. And, it's about the same sort of, it's, it's sort of very related. I think, I think the, um, the differences I would say, at least from my standpoint, uh, I think uh, are about, uh, I think choosing the cost function, choosing the right mechanism, the right optimal transport mechanism has to do uh, with uh, with what you model that you don't know, and I think that's not discussed as much in that in those in that literature. And this now this touches on topics that I'm pursuing with some PhD students precisely. Uh, but but yes, I mean it really I think has a very fundamental economic and economic aspect to it. And uh, it really if if you look at for example. Well, let me just go back, but please remind me, when I go at the end, like in the, in the open problem, sort of like more kind of topics at the end of the third lecture, don't let me go, like tell me, you know, remember, you told me at the beginning this, remind you, okay, now I'm reminding you, please tell me, because this is, I don't want to, you know, waste, spend time talking about something that is perhaps not going to be understood at this level, at the moment, maybe by you, but people who have worked on this, but not for, by the rest of the audience, but when I, when I am at that point after the other lectures, I think we are all going to be on the same page of what I'm talking about. So, you know, I'll come back to that. Okay, so this is, um, so I'm going to first talk about, you cannot talk about optimal transport without talking about the munch kantorovich problem and its duality. And uh, an excellent book that, uh, that you can use for this part are the, the first, like, uh, three chapters <laughs> of Bilani, uh, the 2008 book. There is a 2013 book. And if you go after the three chapters, then it becomes uh, much more difficult and you should use other books if you want. We had a conversation with, with Eric in the, in the breakfast. But for the, for the problem, for the, for the basic problem, and, and, the, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a really, it's, a, it's an excellent reference. Uh, so what is the, what is the standard? What's the Munch problem? So this problem was introduced around around 1750s. It's a, perhaps the oldest kind of civil engineering problem or, or you know, problem that you, you, you can trace. Like, this is really a, a problem of transporting you, a pile of sand. You, you have a pile of sand, which is modeled by, by this profile of this density. And you are interested in covering this sinkhole uh, and uh, according to some functions. So you want to put uh, this, uh, this pile of sand, what's the cheapest way of moving, transporting this pile of sand to some lo location? So you take x, you take this byte of sand that is above x, and you send it to y. And uh, you need to, in the end, do it in such a way that you, that you cover the whole sinkhole. So you need to rearrange this, right? And you are going to uh, compute the cost of transporting x to y according to some cost function, say, for example, the distance. So you are, you are to find this, uh, this transformation t. You tell what is, what is x and you send it to y. And by saying that you, are, that you, need, to, you need to transport the whole uh, um, pile of sand, you need to transport it to cover exactly this sinkhole, uh, you are saying a, that's a statement about the, about the profile of this density function. So I'm going to be assuming that that the pile of sand is normalized, normalized to have mass one, and the sinkhole is normalized to have mass one as well. Yes. Yes. So, so basically, what you're going to do is uh, x will be representing a random point, right? You're going to omega by omega. You send everything, and x will have the distribution of mu, 
and then y is going to have the distribution of v, and those are the constraints. So if you think probabilistically, if you, if you think probabilistically, you see, if you integrate this, this expectation, so you have c x dx, and you, you multiply by the density mu x dx, you transport above x, you transport mu x dx, right? And what's the cost of transportation per unit of mass is c x of, of y, wherever you go, that's t of x. So you integrate this, and so the cost per unit of mass of transporting that little tiny piece of the density is the value of the density mu x times dx. That's what you, that's the byte you took. And then you send it to cxy, and that's the cost of moving it. And then you integrate over all x's, and then you, you get it, right? Yes, so just to make sure, so you have c. So how much you took mu x dx, that's your size, the size of the byte. And how much cost, how much cost uh, is to transport this amount of mass? This is, this is the cost. And then you add over everything. And that's, that's the expected value under mu of c of x dx. Right? And so you are looking for transformations t that minimize that cost. And then saying that uh, in the end you, you need to cover the sinkhole. It means that t of x has distribution v. So in the end, you actually map that to the, to the profile of the sinkhole. You see? So that's, uh, that's, that's, that's called Munch, Munch's formulation of the problem. And it's a very highly nonlinear optimization problem. Yes? Oh, yes, the t of x, uh, you mean a multi-valued function on a set of measures zero. But so this, solution, this problem might not, have a, might not have a solution. This mean might not be achieved. Right, but uh, if, imagine like now you're getting into, you know, if, if, the, if, this, if these things have infinitesimally a small size, you could, you could start rearranging. Maybe this one, okay, you skip some, but some of them you actually send here. And there is like, when you say dx here, this dx here, right, is going to correspond to another dy on the other side. And there is a Jacobian transformation, but it's roughly the same side, except for some, for some constant. Okay. Another way of thinking about this problem, think in discrete, in discrete setting, think of matching. Okay. You have individuals, you have n individuals, and you have, uh, uh, you know, items, n items, and you want to match these items, right? So the Munch, the, the Munch problem corresponds to finding a matching that minimizes some cost. Okay. Now we are going to talk about this, like the, 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 this finding this t function, you know, is, is, is tricky, is not, as I say, it's not a linear problem. Another problem that is better behaved is randomized, randomized policies. So instead of insisting sending, finding the match x person to item, it has to be one to one, maybe randomize, pick a person x, and then do a randomization instead of finding items that are randomized according to some probability depending on x, right? That's a much nicer problem. That I think that this goes to the, what, you, what concerns you, like, you know, how, how, what if I can't, right? Does randomization have an analog in matching problem? Yes, yes, this is a randomized matching uh, policy, yeah. This is, uh, this is, this is, uh, uh, there are, of course, a, a lot of advantages of having a policy that is like a matching in, co in the context of economics because you have clearance, not clearance, and expectations. Sort of. But um, if you are doing it dynamically, but you, you can always make it in such a way that you have uh, matching the, the, the marginals, okay? So this cost function is, uh, as I say, is the cost of transporting the unit of mass from position x to position y. And it's, uh, it's taken to be a positive function. I mean, it could be whatever, but, uh, but it makes sense it's positive, right? Typically, in the optimal transport literature, it's also taken to be a lower semi-continuous function because you are minimizing, and uh, typically, you want lower semi-continuity if you want to you know, minimize it. Some, some property like that. Um, so this, this notation I'm going to be using. So t of x wiggle v means uh, that follows the distribution of v. Uh, so, so this is what this was. Uh, this was uh, this thing that you that concern you and sort of like is back in your mind of you know how do I know that I can also find I can find this t and how do I find it right? 
made the problem really hard, and there was not really much progress for, for about, you know, almost 150 years, until Kantorovich came and said, you know, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's not insist in having matching policies, like not Y, and not X, give me X, and I tell you exactly where to go. Why not randomize? So give me X, and I randomize. And then let's look at that problem, right? So that problem, just introducing that trick makes the problem much nicer. The problem becomes from linear, from nonlinear to linear. So if now you say, okay, now, now what is going on? Okay, so if I randomize, if I randomize, it means that in the end I'm going to have a joint distribution. The joint distribution is X, is the distribution of my pile of sand, mu, and the distribution of my target is Y, that's V, that's, that's uh, modeled by this, uh, by this profile here. And so in the end, when I, when I give you a pre-specified randomized policy, it's equivalent as pre-specifying a coupling, a joint distribution. I have X and Y, and they have some joint distribution, right? What, what's my randomization policy? Well, that's just going to be the conditional distribution of Y given X. So if I compute the joint distribution, I can recover the randomization policy, the random, you know, randomized matching. So now what I'm going to do is I, I, I'm going to do this, introduce this randomization, and now what that means is that I'm looking at all, what are my policies then are in one-to-one -one correspondence to joint distributions, subject to the marginal of X is, uh, is given by mu, and the marginal of Y is given by V. And now what I want to minimize is this uh, expected cost, which is the cost of transporting per unit of mass from X to Y, uh, the, the over all this, the distributions, all, all joint distributions that preserve the marginals, okay? Now the cool thing about this problem is that it might not look to you at, at first sight that there is a, sim a simplification, but this is a linear programming problem now. It's an infinite dimensional linear programming problem, but it's a linear programming problem, okay? The reason is that you see the pi appears linearly the, the integral of an expectation is linear in pi, which is the decision in this problem. And now you are saying that the integral of pi, so you marginalize the over y, the marginal of x is mu, you margin, mar, marginalize over x, the marginal of y is v, and pi has to be positive. Uh, you don't have to write that, that pi integrates equal to one, because it's implicit already, the integral of mu is one and the integral of v is one. So this is like a beautiful, this is, Beautiful linear programming problem. In fact, it's a linear programming form problem that in operations research is called in a standard form. It's already in a standard form. So minimize, the decision is non negative, constraints are equality constraints, and you are minimizing C pi. Okay, so then you can write the dual, right? You can say, okay, I can, I, it's an LP, I'm going to be brave and write the dual. Now, linear programming is not. The duality theory in linear programming doesn't translate directly. It's, it's, uh, if that was the case, then there was no point in convex optimization, the latter conditions. In fact, convex optimization can be written as a special case of infinite dimensional linear programming, which supports hyperplanes and so on. That's one way of saying it. And so the, it's delicate when you actually have duals in convex optimization, right? You need to have you know, the slighter condi slighter condition, other things. So you should not expect that just for free, because you have LP, this is going to have a dual, and there is not going to be a duality gap, and so on. That doesn't, that, no, that doesn't fly. So, but this problem, we are going to see the techniques that are used to prove that uh, strong duality holds, right? But you can always discretize, and then apply duality that always holds in discrete case, right? So if you write the dual of this problem, uh, we're gonna see it later. Okay, so now, I got a little, I, I, this is a, a remark I need to make. So if the C function here, the cost function, is replaced by a metric, then this is what is called the Wasserstein distance, or the Wasserstein metric. So an optimal transport cost between two distributions, uh, when you plug in a metric, that's called the Wasserstein metric. Okay, Wasserstein of order one. Um, if you plug in, for example, dxy equal to uh, for example, this sort of thing, this metric, this metric, for example, then you recover the, the same topology as the Prohorov topology. Right? So this is a bounded metric, and so you, this is you recover exactly weak convergence topology. If you, rep, you plug in the xy equal to the discrete metric, so 
So one, if and only if x is equal to y, you recover total variation. Okay. So this is one way of kind of metrize uh, a space. In fact, a poly space you can you can use you can use here for the metric in the space, and you recover the the Prohor of uh, topology using that that trick, and uh, or you recover total variation. So that's kind of uh, neat. So this is this is this Wasserstein distance. Okay. All right, so if now the, the uh, how do you recover a Munch solution? So if you really want a perfect, like a match, right? So this is, the, uh, it's kind of cool, right? So, so here, if you think about kind of a matching problem, uh, if you look at the infinite dimensional version of a matching problem in economics, that exactly the Munch, can, the Munch problem. And talking about a matching, matching problem, a matching, a matching, Right, really is the same as talking about the Munch solution. How do you recover the, the Munch solution out of the Kantorovich relaxation? Well, you solve the Kantorovich problem, which is a is an LP. So, not surprisingly, under mild assumptions, is going to have that one will always have a solution under very mild assumptions because of the theory of linear programming. It extends nicely for for in this case. And so out of that solution, now you look at the, at the, at the policy, the randomized policy, which is um, uh, the conditional distribution of y given x. So you find the, the joint distribution, and, uh, and a Munch map corresponds to finding some joint distribution, right, for which the conditional distribution of y given x has zero variance, is degenerate, right? So if that exists, then you have found a, a, a Kantorovich solution. If it doesn't exist, then there is no Kantorovich, no, no Munch solution. So that is going to have to do with the, the um, with the, what is called the uh, um, complementary slackness. So you are, um, it's going to be, it, it, it's going to have to do with the support. The, the extreme points of the polytope, uh, for example, in the finite, so that you can give an idea in the finite case, if I were to give you all of this in the finite case, there is a Birkhoff's theorem that tells you that uh, the extreme points are correspond to, to uh, doubly stochastic matrices. So those are, it will be linear combinations of those things. Okay. Uh, so, all right. So as a, a warm-up exercise, we can check that uh, this is a metric, okay? Uh, let's, uh, I'm, going, I'm going to do this, you know, we can, it's, it's not too complicated, right? And, and there is something that is kind of, that is illustrative of this exercise. So um, that this is a metric, if, if C is a metric, that's not, that's not complicated. You see, if uh, X and Y, if C is symmetric in X and Y, then, the definition is going to be symmetric in mu and v, right? Um, so that uh, that the that the distance is positive if the if the metric is positive. Well, that's also that's also follows directly from the definition, right? If it's positive, it's positive, and uh, it doesn't it doesn't uh, it's not hard to convince yourself that uh, that this will be equal. Uh, this uh, mu and v will be equal almost surely. Um, uh, if and only if the distance is zero, okay? Now, the more interesting part is always uh, this uh, uh, triangle inequality, okay? So let's uh, think a little bit what, uh, how, would, how would one go about proving uh, this uh, inequality, right? So one approach is, um, Think of, uh, so compute this uh, sample, sample V. So you want to prove this inequality. So the, the trick to prove this inequality is to introduce what is called the gluing lemma. So I'm going to tell you what, uh, yes, I'll tell you what the, what the thing is. And, and this um, is extremely intuitive for an applied probabilist, what's going on here. But uh, there is something technical and delicate that goes on in an actual, you know, full rigorous proof of this. But it's, uh, you're going to believe the, I think, uh, very easily. So here's the strategy to prove this, okay? 
Um, suppose that you have an optimal coupling okay, uh, for, from the definition of, of this quantity here. So you, you want to minimize the cost according to some metric, and, the, and what you are going to do is you are going to fix the marginal. So pick that coupling, right? So that gives you a coupling between two random variables, x that follows mu and y that follows w. Okay? Now what we're going to do is we're going to sample v. Sample v, right? To start with v sampling v. And now uh, what, what uh, you are going to do is uh, um, you are going to uh, sample uh, x, uh, uh, conditional on, you are going to sample the pair xw, xy conditional on v. Okay, so you are going to introduce like a, a coupling. You can always uh, think of, of uh, coupling preserving uh, the distribution of x and y, uh, x and y as mu and w, and you introduce something that is v, and so that you can have them together that way, right? So then that gives you that gives you the distance between x and y is less or equal to the distance between x and the z. This z follows distribution v plus the distance between z and and uh, and y. So the the idea the the this uh, observation is just simply you know, finding this random variable z, which are, can always be found conditional, and once for every z, just uh, sample x and y. So, um, so keep in mind, so this is the primal, so now uh, uh, this primal problem turns out always has a, a solution. If c is uh, lower semi-continuous, this is, we're going to see basically what is the proof technique to prove this uh, in the case of y and x compact. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, I think this is, let's see. Yes, I think I'm going over this, uh, this uh, you know, proving that, I'm, I'm basically arguing why this is a metric, again, using, you know, more detail. So, um, if, uh, if the distance is equal to zero, Right? Then that means that the random variable, the distance between x and y under the optimal coupling, is equal to zero. And that means that uh, the distance is equal to zero if and only if x and y is almost surely with respect to this pi star. So, and so that means that mu a and, mu, and the v of a, these are equal to, this, these are the same uh, because the marginals are preserved under the optimal solution. So this is proving the hard part of the of that the distance equal to zero implies mu is equal to v. If mu is equal to v, then the distance equal to zero is easy because you just take the, the, the coupling equal to the, the obvious identity coupling is, gives you, right? So this is kind of like the hard part of that. Uh, so this one is the one that I was telling you where you can insert this uh, distribution. So you have x, y, and z, x, y, and v. So you start with the one that in the middle, that's, uh, I think I was calling in Z, but in the slice is V, is Y, uh, that follows distribution V. And uh, you now use uh, the optimal coupling from uh, sampling mu and V, right? So this one, uh, this one, you, so, so basically, you start from this one, uh, and let's see, x is mu, I'm gonna keep that one, and z is w, so I'm gonna change this. So this from x to y, and then from y to w. So the idea is that uh, you start a, y follows distribution v, and now uh, there is an optimal coupling for computing the Wasserstein distance between x and y, right, so that, uh, that co optimal coupling, you sample x given y. This is for the optimal coupling for computing computing uh, the distance between mu and v. Okay. You also sample z uh, conditional on y equal to y, and the way you sample z is from the optimal from the optimal coupling. for uh, d of uh, um, w and v, 
Okay, since V is common, so you, you anchor that. That gives you a coupling from X. This implies, this implies a coupling for um, X and Y, uh, from, for X and Z. This construction implies some coupling for X and Z. But this doesn't have to be the optimal coupling. This is just some coupling, right? So that the triangle inequality tells you that this is in the in the implied coupling, right? And uh, by definition of the optimal coupling between x and z, you just get expected value under p star of d of x and z. So the the thing that I told you was it takes some time to to do and requires a structure, like for example, polished spaces, is to do this sampling, right? So just uh, decomposing the, the measure this way, you know, this has to do with regularity of conditional probabilities and, uh, and, um, and this integration results, that is sort of embedded here. But, you know, it's very natural from, from an applied probability just to this construction, right? If you think in terms of simulation. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, that's basically explaining what I did on the board here. Okay, so that you get this inequality. So you, you, can, uh, uh, you can make it a little more complicated. If you, if you put like a p here, and then take a square root of one over p here, the inequalities will also hold because of the triangle inequality for in LP. And that gives to rise to um, the vastest time distance of order p. Right? So, so just a next step here. I'm not going to talk about that, but you can see why, you know, the the vastest, What is the vastest time distance? What that was the point, and why is it a distance? Okay. So once you have a linear programming problem as the one we have, uh, it's very natural to st to study the dual and to interpret it, right? So we already find an interpretation of the primal problem in terms of matching, and uh, and typically interpretation economic interpretations like that, you know, in terms of matching, they have a, a also interpretation in terms of pricing. So there are shadow prices and so on. So the the that type of interpretation for this problem is extremely rich, and so let's take a look at it. So that's the primal, as I said, is an LP in a standard form. The dual, so it's minimize C transpose X, subjects to A times X equal to B, and X positive, right? That's the standard sort of LP. And so the, the, the dual problem is going to have, you're going to have dual variables for each of the constraints, alpha. Alpha X is attached to this mu DX. So you multiply alpha X times mu DX, right? That's alpha X times mu DX. That's the dual variable. And then you add up over all the constraints. Those are indexed by X. Same thing for V, beta times V dy, and you add up over all the constraints in there is by Y. And uh, you see the, the matrix here, so this is a matrix in the LP, has coefficients equal to one here. Right? So the variable is pi here, so when you actually look at the, at the um, dual constraints, you're going to have alpha X plus beta Y less, less or equal, because it's uh, maximizing with less or equal constraints, CXY. So if you remember your courses in kind of finite dimensional linear programming, this this is this is exactly what that you you know you you see it. I hope you stare at the slide and you say, oh yes, that's uh, that's exactly the dual problem. Cx yes, sorry, this is a typo. Uh, I was uh, got too excited with this Wasserstein uh, distance. So cxy doesn't have to be a metric here. Just cxy, okay? So that's the that's the dual problem. So now, what we are going to do is we are going to interpret what this uh, dual problem means from an economic standpoint. Uh, okay. So something that is very important in in infinite dimensional LP is uh, um, so these are these are measures here. Okay, and uh, and when you actually look at the dual, uh, this is a formal dual. This is from my from intuition from finite dimensional linear programming. These functions here, uh, they have to be well. They have to be at least measurable so that you can write this stuff, right? But uh, the the smaller the class, the better you are to solve this problem. 
Because like you, you know, if you add more and more and more information, that becomes easier to solve in some sense. So for this problem, it turns out you will see why continuous functions are enough to take this. Uh, now, now also know that I'm writing mean here because it turns out, as I say, that the optimizer is always achieved. It's a lot more delicate for the, for the dual problem that might not be achieved in the class of continuous functions. Okay? So it will be achieved in the class of continuous functions if the C, if this uh, cost function here, for example, is Lipschitz and the space is compact, then it turns out that this is achieved and there are other conditions okay, for that. But, uh, but you know, take the, the class of functions, these sort of test functions, that's sort of a tricky, a tricky thing to, to do. And, and in, the, in the problems of uncertainty quantification, like the problems of the, what's the worst case measure, actually that uh, turns out to be mm, quite delicate there. We, you know, the dual problem that goes there, I'm going to explain a little bit about that. The class of functions we need to put in here are L1 measurable functions. And turns out, we need universally measurable, not just uh, Borel measurable. You need alpha, you need uh, uh, for the optimal solution. So you need, if C is um, Lipschitz, continuous, then alpha and beta turns out, the optimal alpha and beta turn out to be Lipschitz. Okay, so let me go back to, to this, uh, to this uh, dual problem and let's try to interpret what the dual problem is doing. So I'm going to think of, uh, of the following sort of market. This is a small market, mini, tiny market, right? There is, a, there is one, uh, uh, there is John who wants to remove a pile of sand from his backyard, like he has in his backyard. And uh, that is a profile according to this uh, density mu. It's the same picture I showed before, it's the same. You have somebody who has a pile of sand and he is sitting in his backyard. And, uh, and there is, a, there is a, uh, his friend, Peter, that uh, has actually a sinkhole in his backyard. Right? So they, what, you know, he, he would like to remove that sinkhole in his backyard and uh, John, he would like to remove the pile of sand. So the perfect situation would be they arrange and they, you know, figure out a way to actually solve the problem, right? So, the, so but John and Peter are really smart people. So they could compute what's the cost of actually moving the pile of sand to cover the sinkhole, right? And the cost that they would, they, they would imply for uh, doing this activity would be given by the solution of the optimal transport problem. Now, imagine that there is like a, a very clever lady who sees a business opportunity here. And so she says, you know what? Uh, she, her name is Maria, right? So she has a business, she runs a business, and she would like to convince John and Peter that instead of actually going this hard, laborious work of moving the pile of sand, they should just go hang up for a beer, you know, at the small price of actually just giving her something, which should be convenient, economically convenient, right? So she's thinking, okay, how do I convince them? Okay. So, so she, she can go and she can promise to both of them, right? You don't worry about it. Just go for, for your beer, your coffee, whatever, and I'll take care of it. I'll transport everything. It's going to be clean, nice, the whole covered, everything. So what is uh, going to do? She is going to say to John, I'm just going to charge you alpha of X uh, dollars per unit of mass that I move. And uh, she goes to Peter and says, you know, I'm going to charge you beta of Y dollars per unit of mass that I move. And the, and the cost uh, is going to be the, what I, for, for them to agree, the, uh, the, the sum of the cost has to be less than the cost of transportation. Now, in this contract, this is a all of nothing thing. They, they cannot choose like, Oh, yes, Maria, but I just want you to transport this little pile of sand, right? That's, you know, then I take care of everything. No, no, no. She's like, you know, you, you want everything, all the whole deal or nothing. So that's why she's saying, you know, for all X, Y, right? So, there's, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a, you would have to, uh, that's a constraint in this type of contract. That is the whole thing, the whole enchilada, the whole package. Right? So it's alpha of X plus beta Y. And so what Maria wants to do is she wants to mix, maximize her profit. So in the end of the end, once she's done transporting everything, she's going to maximize the cost 
the profit she makes out of uh, John and the profit she makes out of Peter. So you see, like, uh, that's exactly, those are exactly the constraints. Like, she, she wants to maximize the profit subject to the constraint that alpha of x plus beta y is less or equal to cxy. Right? Now, the theory, the optimal transport theory, like, if, if a strong duality holds, then a strong duality guarantees that there exists a way to do this, right? That, the, that in fact, the, the optimal maximizer policy for Maria is the same as the optimal transportation cost of Peter and John. And so if, if a strong duality holds, then economic theory will tell you there is an equilibrium. There is a way to implement the equilibrium in a decentralized way by pricing, and there is market clearance. So it's super cool, right? So that's why economists love this stuff, because they, they, this is a way to actually construct this equilibrium. Now, uh, one thing that, uh, that also uh, uh, linear optimization gives you for free, again, if this uh, all holds, is uh, complementary slackness. You see, so this is the dual variable, right? So uh, the theory of uh, linear programming is going to tell you that, uh, that or uh, the, the um, Karushkin tucker condition says that uh, C of xy minus alpha of xy minus beta of y times the primal uh, variable, optimal primal variable, pi x, y is equal to zero. So only one of, one of the two have to be equal to zero. So well, that's the same as saying that, that alpha star x plus beta star y equal to six y, pi star almost surely. Because those are the pi x, y equal to zero. Those are the ones that, those are, that, that means x, y have probability zero of being uh, attained there. So, so reinterpretation of the complementary slackness is the same as saying, you know, at the optimum, the optimal solution, alpha and beta, have to satisfy this. Now, as I said, this might not exist. Okay? You, you need some conditions, extra conditions, Lipschitz, etc. But this is one way to think about constructing the solutions, in fact. So, next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, so, uh, I'm going to give you an example of how to actually derive this, uh, find these solutions, alpha and beta using this condition, right? This is what economists do, yes. No, no, they don't have to be non-negative. So, but, but you have pointed out exactly to one, one modeling sort of assumption, right? So the government, so you see one thing here is that, and you use this observation quite a bit in the proofs. Um, if, you, if, if you give $1 discount to John and give and increase the price to Peter of $1, uniformly, that doesn't change the value of the objective function. So this solution is not unique, cannot be unique, right? However, there are, you know, economists, like in economic interpretation, you can, you can, for example, this might represent, you will see the example I'm going to be using, alpha is going to represent the price of, for example, uh, labor, and beta is going to correspond the, to the, the price of technology. So you have alpha and beta, so you, a labor market in which you are going to match uh, um, workers with the companies of certain skills and technology, type of technology. And uh, so you can set, for example, minimum salary. The minimum salary might set the, the, this ambiguity. Or in this context, for example, is if it's the government or some, some, is some, some transfer of wealth from alpha, from, from the participants, economic participants. So there is this ambiguity in terms of the pricing. Right? So either you fix it by regulation or you fix it by some mechanism of subsidy. Right? So that's the role of the government in this thing. At least this is my interpretation of the thing, right? The economists don't really talk a lot about <laughs> not this. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, so the, for the existence of dual optimizers, you need, you need conditions. You need, uh, for example, C positive and C X, Y being bounded by, by functions that are independent of X and Y, you know, a of x and b of y, and they have, uh, they have mean zero. So that's a sufficient condition for the existence, but not for the smoothness. You still might have like something that is rough. Okay, so a little bit of, of a proof of what's the proof technique that goes with this, right? So the, the kind of, uh, the main tool to prove the strong duality in this result is a result that is called the um, Sion, Sion's mean max theorem, okay? This is a very like far-reaching generalization of von Neumann 
von Neumann's min, min max theorem. So I'm going to state it here. So you need a function. You have a function f uh, goes to from some space to some spa space and uh, say to the reals, which properties uh, do, you, do you need? You need this function to be f as a function of x. For every y, this function has to be concave. And um, concave and lower semi-continuous. Uh, you need the function as a function of y. You need this uh, concave, uh, sorry, upper semi-continuous uh, as a function of, um, as a function I'm going to be minimizing, so then I guess this indeed was convex and lower. I'm going to be maximizing, so that's concave and upper semi-continuous. And uh, you need either either uh, s of x, so s of x and s of y are convex. And you need either s of x compact or s of y compact. That's the form in which you use it. There are many extensions, different forms, relaxing, for example, the convexity to quasi-convexity, etc. But, uh, but in, if you use it in this form and you have your x and y compact, so the, the cool thing about this result, this science theorem, is that uh, you pick the topology. You see, this notion, this requires a notion of continuity and whenever you have continuity, you need to select, it's up to you, you choose the topology. Just pick any topology, be creative, to make sure that this theorem applies. Okay, so the, um, if you have X and Y compact, for example, uh, you can, you can uh, introduce this uh, uh, trick in optimization, right? Where we, you, you ex re express the constraints using a class of test functions. Uh, the, so the class of test functions in this context that, uh, that, uh, that, that is enough is the class of continuous functions. So for, this, for um, probability measures taking values on a polished space, uh, the equality, so this equality, which is the primal constraint, this equality, uh, if you, you want to take a test function here in the right-hand side, take a test function in the left-hand side, and you integrate over, over x, and you want to claim that's if that is equal for a large class of test functions, then it has to be equal for the measures, right? So a, a statement about the quality of measures is a statement about the computing the probability for every set that you can think that is measurable. Those are a lot of things. So to translate that into, into test functions, spaces, you need to pick a large enough, large enough class, right? So bear in mind that I have, this is not RD. This could be whatever, okay? So if you think of the probability measures x and y taking values on a polished space, for example, the space of continuous functions, et cetera, with the right topology, the uniform topology, for example, then uh, continuous functions as test functions are, are, are an enough, large enough class. So if you take continuous functions, you multiply uh, alpha of x and, or g of x and you integrate, uh, and that is true for all continuous functions, then the measures are the same. You don't need to check for all the for all the um, sets. Am I, am I finishing? Is, am I done? Yeah. Okay, wow, this was fast. <laughs> all right, well, oh boy, look at this. this. Okay, <laughs> so I'm just going to finish the thought here. Just a bit. So once you have that, then the natural topology to pick for the, pro, for the set of measures is the, is the Prohor of topology. And turns out that uh, that space, if the space is X and Y is compact, that for free you get compactness. So then you can swap. And if you swap, then, uh, then you get a strong duality, right? 
then a lot of the of the proof involves extending you know relaxing the compactness but for for a three day course i'm going to keep with compact okay that's the way to do it okay so now next lecture i'm going to start from from like uh, using using this thing to i'm an engineer so I like to see things explicit. Like I'm not enough like, oh, there exists, there exists. So I actually want to see the alpha and the beta. At least show me once what's an alpha and the beta and tell me what it means. So that's what it comes next. Like we are going to talk about how to compute closed formulas and how to interpret them in terms of economics, in terms of economics. That's it. <laughs>